All right, so this week we have a, a grand interview. Um, very excited about this. I actually talked with these guys before, um, way back in the day when I used to do Film Club. Uh, Nathan Basil and David J. Stevies. We did. I uh, I talked with them way long time ago. Uh, these are the guys behind behind the mask, the rise of Leslie Vernon. I think one of the funnest cult horror movies of the last twenty years. Um, yeah, it was it was I, I was able to get them get them to come together. Uh, mostly David, uh, we we talked to uh, Nathan was kind of like in the middle of something. So, but he he popped in, talked to us a little bit at the beginning. He was having some tech difficulties, uh, some some internet issues, and there was a couple times David did too as well, but. Uh, eventually it starts to clean up a little bit uh, as the interview goes on. So we both, we apologize uh, for that. Uh, I didn't want to try to sit here and try to edit it all together and make it neat. Cause it kind of goes in and out and it would be really hard to make it seamless. So I figured, you know, just to uh, warn you that there is a little bit of jumbleness, some, a couple interruptions, but uh, I, st- I, th- I think we, we, we don't let it fumble too much. So it flows nice. Uh, but yeah, Andrew, Excited about that interview? Yes. Yeah, yeah. It was a a very interesting interview, especially the, the you know the second half. We get into all kinds of different other topical things, dealing with the, the horror genre, dealing with <clears throat> kind of the modern conception of the horror genre, as well as you know classic influences that went into Behind the Mask. For those of you who haven't seen Behind the Mask yet, um, do so any way you can. I mean, it is available on Blu-ray through Scream Factory. Uh, that's probably the best way to see it. Uh, since this is a physical media centric podcast, I might as well plug yes. that in. Um, it does have great special features, as you know, as well as you know, great picture and sound quality. Came out in two thousand and six, which still boggles my mind because that feels like so long ago, in a very distant, distant past. Which this film feels like it was also ahead of its time, so probably appropriately that it came out. Um, during that 2000s era. Um, I feel like we live in such a, a meta world now, and this thing is was doing meta things at that time. So it was nice to kind of see where the mind was when it went into the writing of this and the concepts behind it. So yeah, really awesome interview. Yeah, yeah. And and of course, we were also talking with him about his new short that links to the Leslie Vernon universe. Uh, wait for it, which you can't see it yet, but hopefully at some point in the near future, you will. But with all that said, here is our interview with David J. Stevie, writer, director, and actor Nathan Basil of Behind the Mask, Rise of Leslie Vernon. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Chasing Labels once again. And uh, once again, we're going to have another uh, great pair of guests this week. Um, Andrew, you know, it's Halloween time. And it is indeed. We, we thought a lot about this. And, and fortunate enough for me, I, I, we, I actually had connections with these guys before. Uh, way back in the day, this many years ago, with the old show I used to do. And so I was like, you know, for the Halloween, we got to do something cool. We got to get people connected to the horror community excited. And I didn't, I was like, this is perfect. I haven't talked to these guys in a long time. And uh, to me, this is one of the, one of my favorite cult horror films. Um, uh, it, it, Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon, uh, to me, uh, really you know kind of brought us back to that kind of like what scream did you know kind of self-referential kind mm. of thing with horror but also created a great uh new character in the horror genre with of course leslie vernon right and uh we have here today none other than the writer producer and also the star of that film mr leslie vernon and himself we have david j stevie and nathan basil what's up guys hey boys Hello. Hey. So they, they let us out of the box. They had us trapped in. Mm. You know that. You know, kind of like the puzzle box. We hell We hold back on some of the. You know, we we gotta we gotta hold them back, and then we finally break. We haven't done an interview in months. Um, so, so we, we finally, a little rusty. Maybe a little rusty, but uh, we're glad to have you guys here. Um, thank you for taking the time. And uh, so uh, on, just just on a personal level, uh, how's everything going? How's it? How, how's the day to day? Um, better now. I mean, I don't know how much you want to jump into that right now, but 154 days of a strike is over. So that's, well, that was great news. I was going to say that's, it's, it's great that, uh, finally a deal got worked out and, uh, and now work can, 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 uh, you know, resume, can resume. Um, there we are. Well, Nathan's back with us. 
Yeah, to a degree. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, I can jump in and say I'm incredibly appreciative and grateful for what the WGA negotiating committee and, you know, tens of thousands of members holding the line for that long. Um, you know, I, I'm incredibly proud that we, we fought a fight that needed to be fought and I'm grateful for that. And, but, uh, that doesn't really change anything until sag after gets their deal done. So I stand in solidarity with them and that's, you know, member of Nathan's a union member of, so yeah, we're, we're there, we're getting there. It's not quite done yet, but I am looking forward to, yeah, as you said, I'm looking forward to getting back to work. Um, awesome. So. Awesome. Nathan. How's it going over there, man? How, you, I, like I was saying before, uh, you're looking sweaty, looking like you're, you're outside, loving the sun. Yeah, I'm sorry about the internet situation. Is this... Come on. <laughs> oh, no, no. It's okay. But, well, until we get that figured out. Uh, I, I, so... don't know. Oh. I don't know what's wrong. I don't know. <laughs> independent filmmaking yeah yeah, you know, yeah, way, yeah you know, this, way, you know it, goes, it goes with the the whole theme of the show with the kind of rudimentary independent filmmaking um it feels like we're dealing with 2006 technology right now <laughs> with with the way in which um you know behind the mask was made i did not realize that the movie had come out in 2006 which seems like several lifetimes eons ago, ago. eons <laughs> eons but uh, yeah. of course, we're also here to talk about your short. Uh, wait for it, um, which you wrote, directed, produced. You know, you you've been working on it for a long time. I actually, uh, of course, you know, I, I this is how I blackmailed you into coming on here was because <laughs> I, I did give you some money for that short, and then you know, of course, COVID happened, and a lot of things happened. It takes yeah. a long time to make any any film of any length, and then finally, it got finished, and uh, I was like, I was supposed to get. A chance to see it. I want to see it. And then they <laughs> and so you, then just, I was, you just strong armed them. I strong armed the Kickstarter them. campaign. Yeah, we tried to totally I mean standing outside my bedroom window was a little much, Steven, but I mean um, I had a re you know, I needed a reason to use that money I got from a bonus from work and I used it to get a plane ticket, came out to you. I was like, he's gonna love this because he loves serial killer stuff. So yeah, I could, you know, just yeah. be out outside his window. You know, yeah, no, maybe, maybe rethink that next time. But no, my but wife I, didn't like that I spent that money. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, uh, it, you know, it was a, it was an incredibly long pro. I mean, that's the first time I've ever directed. I mean, I've been a screenwriter my life, my whole life. And I don't, I don't know that I need to get back behind the camera if I'm being really honest. Um, I'm glad I did it. It was an incredible learning experience. And, you know, being able to, to see that side of it, it was a conversation that I had had with, um, I, I had gotten lucky enough to get a development meeting with Ryan Turek at Blumhouse. And in the co course of that conversation, he said, you need to, I, I mentioned I had a, an idea for a horror short film, but I didn't know how to direct. And he just sort of stopped the conversations. Like you absolutely need to do that. Yeah. And I was sort of taken aback. And he's like, you, you, you need to know what it's like as a writer to, you know, write down, you know, exterior spaceship. Uh, and then to <laughs> understand what that means when you're, you know, Tuesday morning, 4.30 in the morning, and you, you know, you have to figure that out and you're on a set, like you need to understand how what you write on the page translates to the work that a whole bunch of other people are going to have to do. Yeah. And it's some of the best advice I've ever gotten. Yeah. Um, but having said that, I'm glad I did it. Um, you know, I, I guess I'd like to learn more, but uh, the, the whole experience of wait for it was just really uh, I knew that I needed to add that tool to my toolbox. And of course I wanted to have it to be sort of relevant. So to try to find a way to tie it into the Leslie Vernon universe, yeah. which, you know, to date, that's, that's my calling card, right? That's, that's what I hang my hat on as a filmmaker. And, uh, you know, my career in the industry is, is hinged on, on Leslie Vernon. Um, so they all kind of folded together. Everything came together. Well, it just it took a really, really long time. And so I, I, I apologize. You didn't get your, Oh reward yeah, reward billings, but just relax, Jesus. <laughs> We're here now. It's fine. It's fine. I'm, I, you know, I was, I was, I was pissed for so many years. <laughs> I was so pissed. Um, no, I mean, I, I, I wanted to, I wanted to definitely put whatever I could at the time towards that project because I am such a fan of Leslie Vernon, and I know, um, as somebody that's an amateur, I've done some amateur filmmaking. How hard it is to just do, just just to get a group of people together. You know, um, and of course you want to pay them people. You want to give them 
you know, what they're worth, you know, you know, and not, you know, it's fun to get a group of people together just to do something for free. Yeah. A lot of people could do yeah. that, but if you really want to get the, get the talent and get the, and you know, do it the right way, you, you need to be able to pay people. And, and I get it. It takes a long time to get that money. I mean, Leslie Vernon was made for very, a very, you know, small amount of money, but it looks fantastic. Um, mm. And uh, yeah, please, please, um, you know, before we get too deep, deep into Leslie Vernon uh, canon here, I do want to start out with just like the, the kind of the basic love of movies. Like, was it, was it, where did it start for you guys? And um, it looks like Nathan might be with us now. Um, I think he was mountain biking or something. I, he was, he was going through, you know, so I don't know. Lost, he dropped his foot. Who knows? But, uh, Let's start just at a basic level. I want to know where the beginning of like the pathway to to where you are now started, David. Um, man, I think that the earliest I remember really loving movies was the first job, the real job I got uh, living in Wisconsin. I worked at a, a pick and save video store, which pick and save was a local grocery store chain in the Midwest. And they opened a video store for VHS and beta tapes. Um, and I, I, you know, I got this job and it was the coolest job in town because it was brand new and I was working with movies. And I think that was the, you know, being in that video store and being surrounded by all of those movie titles. Um, that was the first time I was like, wow, this, this place is a portal. This is not, this is, it's like a library, you know, this is like, there's avenues to other places in the universe and your imagination here. And I remember thinking that, um, I mean, I was probably super high, but still it was relevant. <laughs> Uh, no, but I think um, no, you don't. You don't have to take it back. We we, we understand. It was right. It was it was you, a different you, you, time. It was <laughs> true. It's fine. Oh, did we lose David now? Oh, oh Nat, Nat, see, look what you did, Nathan. You you rubbed <laughs> off on. So, I think so you, you transferred over to him now. <laughs> All right, so I guess so, I guess it's as good a transition as ever to get yeah. over to Nathan. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> now that you're here with us. Um, Please, Nathan, uh, tell us a little bit about your backgrounds uh, for people that don't know about uh, what Nathan Basil does when he's not, you know, murdering people. Oh, uh, which is most of the time. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, uh, I teach acting now, but I trained uh, in acting for a long time, a lot of different institutions and um, and uh, had a good career to out acting, doing things. I'm not done acting, but um, but yeah, did some uh good film tv and uh and theater work and um and i've been teaching for the last um well seriously for the last 10 years and um yeah so that's that's my thing now until <laughs> until until behind the mask uh you know sequel uh comes around then uh, I, I'll, I'll just keep doing my my same old hustle well, we, 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 we're really hoping for it. We'll get more into that later, but, uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's great. You know, I, I, I see that I saw most of what you were doing now was, uh, I mean, other than teaching was, uh, you do, you're doing some post-production kind yeah, of, work. yeah, I do a lot of post-production stuff with the original productions. Uh, we do, uh, reality TV programming. Yeah. So yeah, that's, um, that's <laughs> definitely been helping me pay the bills so that I can do what I love doing, you know? Yeah. Awesome. I'm gonna, I'm right. gonna jump in there though and say that I had the privilege of taking Nathan's class. Um, I've tried it a couple times, and I'm not an actor any more than I am a director. But it's uh, he's selling himself a little bit short on his passion for, you know, his ability to to crack into that with a bunch of strangers is pretty phenomenal to watch. And I think that's something I've always really enjoyed about Nathan as a as a performer, not just as a friend, but as a performer and an artist, is that he he is pretty humble about a considerable skill set that he has. Um, and it's pretty cool to watch him teach because I can see flashes of, of that performer coming out in him. Um, so I'm doing everything I can to get him back in front of a camera as soon as yeah. possible. Well, of course he's a, you know, I know he gets, he gets, he gets made fun of for this, but he's Juilliard. He's a Juilliard trained actor. Yeah. <laughs> it must look good on a resume. It looks good. It doesn't hurt. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> um, how, how, when it comes to, you know, how much do you, how much do you get your, your, your students talking to you about Leslie Vernon? Do they ask you a lot of questions about it? Uh, no, I don't 
tend to talk about it too too much yeah. i don't tend to talk about me too too much yeah. um i i think that's probably why i enjoy <laughs> instruction is because i don't have to deal with any of this yeah i get to just deal with that yeah i got you but back to david uh before you, you know your computer interrupted you um uh your video store da hi david video store um oh. <laughs> Right. Then I, 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 when I in college, I worked in an Orpheum movie theater yeah. um, and it was a beautiful old theater. And at that point, I, I was a creative writing major and I thought I was going to be a novelist and I was going to write the next great, you know, great American novel. And I was in the theater one night. I think I was watching like Silence of the Lambs or something. And I just, I just had this this gobsmack moment where I'm like, God, I'm, your whole life you've been around movies. You're obsessed with movies. Why aren't you trying to write a script? And I had sort of wasted most of my college years at that point, I didn't go into film school. I didn't go on that route. So I'd gotten an English creative writing degree um, and had to then go back almost post-college and retrain myself yeah. how to write a screenplay because um, it's a completely different set of muscle. Um, and I came to it late. But once I started you know, writing screenplays, I'm like, oh, my God, yeah, this is this is it. I mean, yeah. ultimately, it's about affecting an emotional response in people. And I, I firmly believe that film does that, uh, at least if it's done right. Um, and you get it out and, and, you know, fitting that we're on this podcast, because I still think, you know, having a bunch of people watch a movie together is the best possible way to do okay. that. It comes back to theater of, of, of old. And I think mm. a shared experience, and if you can evoke an emotional response, and get a, a thematic sort of message out there. Um, and if you can do that to, you know, 50 or a hundred or a thousand people at a time in a, in a collective experience, it even amplifies that experience for all of them. And I think that does two things. It affects the individual. Uh, but I also think it sort of, you walk out of an experience like that a little bit more bonded to the, to the hundred people you were in there with. And I think that's something we kind of sorely need in our culture right now. I can't agree more. We've, we've, we've had that same sentiment in ourselves with many of our guests, you know, that the shared experience is something we need to continue to, to, to prop up, you know, uh, you know, whether it's the theater, you know, the movies in the theater or, you know, at, you know, theater acting, you know, that's, that's all that stuff. I think you need to be, there's something different about it being there with a group of people and, and it, you know, it's contagious things, the, the emotion from the film, if you can just get people to, to pay attention, you know, to mm. drop their phones. There's all, yeah. To that's focus, been, you know, the that's biggest the hardest backdrop, part. I guess, to any kind of live event, whether it be theatrical in the theater, whether it be at the cinema, whether it be sports. Oh, events, music, whatever. music too. I mean, music everybody's the got their way. phone out recording yeah. the thing. And I'm like, I've, well, yeah, you, I've seen things at you know. music performances where people are not really paying attention to the yeah. performers. They're kind of just there living in their own little world yeah. and stuff. I mean, yeah, and it's something I think a lot of us or a lot of the older generations really their love of movies started you know started with going to the movies, going to the cinema, living yeah. having a living experience, that life experience really, and having those building those memories, you know what I mean? And then passing on those memories to other people, other generations. The the magic of movies, if I could glorify it in some some type of God, it's so way, sentimental it's, it's way. So sentimental, God, yeah, it's too stop. sentimental. Really, shut up. I should really shut shut up. Spielberg over here. I know, um, very modern. Andrew, Andrew, to your point though, I I always wonder when I go to a concert and I see like the, the 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 crowd of people holding their phone up and they're they're watching the concert through their two inch screen, recording it. And I'm like, it's happening live right over it's there. It's right there. It's right in front of but you. But I always wonder, I always wonder, like, who of those people actually sits down and then watches the concert again on their phone? No, it looks like shit. It's going to look like shit. <laughs> Why would it's you do dark. They, just, they just do it to post a picture. Yeah. And it's like yeah. you're cheating yourself at the experience just to get a follower somewhere down the line. And it's, I mean, it's I know, cool it's to I'm capture. Kids get off my lawn, but God, that drives me nuts. It's like it's happening I, right in front of you. That said, Stevie, you've got a short film out that you want people to use their phones to acquire <laughs> and to to watch, right? <laughs> wait a second. I, should don't I wait for it? Don't oh, shit on them too much. <laughs> yeah, you may need them. <laughs> I see what you did there. I mean, if they want to watch Wait For It on their phone, that's fine. It's 13 minutes long and it's only this big, but, you know. <laughs> I still think they should try to watch it at least on their TV screens. Well, yeah, well, that's, that's interesting because we always talk about 
I mean, Stephen and I have talked about what is the artist's intent, what is director's intent. You know, a lot of directors recently have come out against streaming. They've come out against people watching movies, like you said, on their phones and stuff. And it's kind of, it's kind of like they didn't make the movies to be kind of watched in that way. You know, did you kind of think about how the, your movie was going to be watched in kind of a modern day way? You know, whether it be through streaming, because I know you're also you're also taking the movie around to different film festivals and stuff. Is that the intended way for for we to be to be watching this? I I mean I honestly I gotta confess I didn't I didn't think that through enough when I started this streaming wasn't wasn't the end all be all believe it or not I mean I started this idea back in like 2015 that's how long it takes even just yeah. to do a short film and none of this would be happening first shout out I get to make it to Chris Jarowski who's one of my executive producers Chris has done all of the work to get this thing into festivals. Um, once it was done, you know, it was a learning exercise for me and I tapped Nathan because I thought that would help get more people's eyeballs on it, but I didn't have a clue how to do that. Um, and then Chris kind of stepped in and said, look, you know, you, well, I should pack up by the time I, I got it done, you know, Frankie Guerrero, my DP made me look great. Um, and Craig Updike, my editor made me look even better because he fixed the thing in post um and called in all the favors and it's such a collaborative process and you guys have heard that a million times but i didn't i didn't do shit i mean this i, I had i had the idea and i i, I got a uh, bunch of people talking with this dude who was for years just just you know wrapping himself over the shoulders with the fact that he wasn't you know moving forward he wasn't doing he wasn't doing he wasn't in action this and that and then he made a film he'd never made a film before he made a film because that's what everybody does right they just make a film and then he went through the entire process from conception to execution to fine tuning and cutting i mean that's for me uh, it it doesn't even matter if the product ends up good you know good it's just it's Herculean to go through that process. And he took it on and did it and ended up with a result that was, uh, I think, really awesome. Yeah, I, I, I can agree. I, yeah, I mean, and, and people could could look at the, the fact that it's only 14 minutes. I, I'm telling you, it takes a big machine, which is the, the, the film the film studios that are out there, Warner Brothers, to make these two hours. Th it, it's a machine. When you're mm. talking about this size of a movie, and you only that's have a, a very minute amount of people working on it. That's why it takes so long to make such a small, because it's hard to make a movie. It's not, yeah. it's not easy to make any movie and let no matter how small it is. And, and to make it as well crafted as yours was uh, it, it's, it, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. Anytime anything's made that well. Cause I, I, I have to agree. It's, it's even for, you know, as much as you want to take it off yourself, that they made you look good. The editors that, you know, but as you had a vision, the visions right. always starts with the director, uh, and and then you you collaborated, which is the whole thing. Well, I, 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 you know. the, the vision starts with the writer. I got to be a little territorial. Well, there, you're but. the same one in the same. So okay, fine. Yeah. But you, know. you, you had multiple hats on. You had multiple hats. <laughs> yes, on. you did. I remember the end of the credits, and then it said uh, writer, producer, director. I, I feel like you wanted to add a few more things in there, but you didn't. And then you were like, I can't act in it too. So, well, I mean, uh, you are, you're trying there. to M night Shyamalan it. I get well, it. I'm just I saying you are up there with many greats who did that. Uh, you know what I mean? Did that, you know, took on the multiple roles of making movies, you know, being writing, directing and producing um, is, is there's, is there are three different things and they're all have different responsibilities, different, different yeah. burdens, different complications, I assume. And yet, it's a I tough know, I, thing to do. I know we're I know we're building you up really high, but I well, mean, I think well, we're doing. It, it's well, a bit, it's, I I, I, I want to say that I do want to answer your question, Andrew, which is I didn't I didn't really know where it would end up. I didn't know who would see it. It was for me. It was a very it was a vanity project. It was an exercise like, can I do this? What is this like? Yeah. What happens? And it absolutely has made me a better screenwriter. Um, working with Nathan in his acting class has made me a better screenwriter. It's just. Um, you know, it's it was a labor of love, and the fact that it's going to get out there and be seen by anyone, I think, is just that's just icing on the cake. And I'm and I'm I'm glad it's being well received. And you know, I just I'm incredibly proud of all the work that everybody else did to help me get it here. I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, and um, I wanted I wanted yeah. to ask you, working with Nathan in his acting classes, was that done specifically so you could get to know how to work with actors to make this movie, or was that just something you had done out of curiosity? No, he's strong on me into doing it. Oh, I need. 
You make them pay? Did you make them pay for it? I don't think I made you pay. Uh, maybe I did make you pay. I probably made you pay. Yeah. Guys, I got to jump off. Um, okay. I, I'm uh, going to join my group, but um, it's good to see you all. And uh, Thank you. Um, love you, Stevie. All right, brother. Boop. All right, guys. Boop. See you in, uh, Thanks, see you in Sacramento. See you in Sacramento. <laughs> Those aren't pillows. <laughs> All right, man. So Have a good one. Nathan and I are, Nathan and I are going to uh, Sinister Creature Con. Yeah. Plug plug alert. And it's so cool. Whenever I get to appear with Nathan, I mean, nobody comes to see the screenwriter, but Nathan and Angela are both going to be at Sinister Creature Con on October 22nd, I think. And yeah. so they, uh, Tim, um, the organizer, you know, found an extra chair for me. So I'm going to get to go up and and sit and talk shop and talk to fans with Nathan and Angela and ride their coattails. And I can't wait. It, I'm sorry you couldn't stick around longer because that guy oh, it's is. Okay. Oh, no, that's fine. It was very no, good. I mean, in general. You're, yeah. you're the man behind all of all of this stuff, man. You're, you're, you're from the, you're the one that helped conceive this whole idea. So, you know, uh, you're definitely the guy we want to talk to. Um, <laughs> so, you know, of course we want to get a little bit into, into Leslie Vernon itself, but wait with wait for it. Um, you know, of course, you've had you've wanted to make a sequel to uh, Behind the Mask for a while, and uh, you no, know, there is a comic book. If nobody's aware of this, there and I, I didn't get my hands on it. I, I always wanted to get my hands on it, but I know there's a comic book uh, before the mask um, yeah. that that kind of gives you a little bit of what the sequel could have been. Um, uh, tell well, tell yeah, everybody I mean, about that. In in the in the lore of it, I mean, uh, so we we worked on the sequel almost immediately. Because yeah. you know, we even though Behind the Mask didn't do well commercially, we got a sense pretty quickly that the fan base was starting to respond to it, and that's that has carried through for all this time. And I, I always say every chance I get, none of this would be happening. I wouldn't be here talking to you guys without the fan base. This this thing got no help, no push, no advertising, no nothing, and it just it found its legs in years three, five, seven, twelve, fifteen. And it's just, it's never, the fans have never given up on, on Leslie Vernon and uh, none of this would be happening without them. And, but even in the immediate aftermath of that, Scott Glosserman, the director and I knew like, okay, we got to, you know, there's more to tell. And so I wrote a sequel. We couldn't get the funding for it, which is incredibly frustrating. Um, and it just ended up, we just ended up like, we got to get it out there. Like Scott, I think Glosserman got to a point where it was like, we're just sitting on this. This is no good. It's just, it's on your hard drive. It's on my hard drive. Let's get it out there as canon, and and we'll go from there. Like you know, we got to give, we got to do something to keep the drumbeat going. And it ended up being the the graphic novel. And Nathan Thomas Milner, who did the artwork, is fantastic. And I would say, if you don't know his artwork, oh man, look, get to know that guy because his art, his horror fan art, is just next level stuff. Um, yeah. And so to get him to do the graphic novel was absolutely a coup. So the point of all that is, is we couldn't get the movie made, but we didn't want to give up on it. So we found a way to get the neck. The, it is a sequel. It's called Before the Mask, The Return of Leslie Vernon, which is, of course, itself a deconstructive play on sequels, prequels, remakes, yeah. right? It's sort of all of them rolled into one. Um, and then that story itself, there's sort of a meta movie within a movie, sort of self referential kind of a scream, sort of a nod. So, you know, we did everything we wanted to do with the sequel, and the graphic novel, Nathan did his best, but you can only do so much with, you know, six, six issues and panels. Um, and I'm bummed that this film itself, the full weight and breadth of it never got made. Um, but, you know, that ship has sailed and people always ask, well, well, you know, what if you do, why can't you do it now? Why can't you do it now? Um, it's too dated. Uh, you yeah. know, Nathan and Angela have, have aged out of it. Scott Wilson's passed away. Yeah. You know, Robert England's not, you know, necessarily where he used to be. Um, so it would be really pretty ridiculous to try to, you know, get a bunch of people to pretend it was 2010. Yeah. Um, so the, the next level then is, well, if we're going to do another Leslie Vernon story, it would have to be contemporary. Yeah. And you know, that's, that's the goal now. And that's, that's what drives me. And like, you know, it's something I desperately want to, to, bring to reality and Nathan's down for it and everybody's back and everybody's in. It's just, it's a matter of the business side of it. Yeah. It's a, which it's is always the... the most complicated part, you know, for those of you like listening and for those of you watching this in the future, the business side of filmmaking is like a whole other 
but like bag of wha- bag of stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? We don't talk about it a lot, and we would Steve and I are no experts on it, but it's you hear about certain things all the time and in press releases and all kinds of stuff, but it's so much more in depth than that. Even on a project as small as a sequel to a you know a low budgeted horror film from the 2000s is probably so like you said so complex to try to get off the ground really i see so many crappy horror movies get (laughs) sequels all the time um and it's like you know (laughs) it's it's really kind of i'm pretty sure luck has a lot to do with it nowadays and stuff and just the you know you find the right financing you find the right people you make the right calls you do all the stuff i mean but it's and then of course you as you said dave uh, david it's you know time is also a factor too you know it's a movie Mm -hmm. that came out in 2006 what is the audience for it now compared to back then completely different obviously right but also like the whole game is different in terms of movie marketing and movie selling and all that kind of stuff that's true. I, I think the, the two things that leave to mind there are one, you know, the, the fan base has never deserted us. So I, I, I think that, you know, if we're lucky enough to get a third a third story off the ground, I think it's going to be very well received. I think it'll be better received than the first movie because now you guys, have the fans have done all of the work for the past, you know, 15 years to build that fan base. Um, but to your point, Andrew, I think what I struggle with having lived in Hollywood for two decades is that this the the system is broken and you know forgive me for getting my on my soapbox here for a minute but you know i'm, I'm on the front row i'm in the i'm in the trenches on this and i see it and it's it's film studios used to be about making films television studios used to be about making tv shows and they cared and they paid attention to to what they were creating they, they mattered they watched the movies they were making you know i go going way back samuel goldwyn wanted to make sure that the movies that were put, being put out were good. You know what I mean? Like NBC used to want good TV shows and it's become so corporate and they've been absorbed by these corporations that are their, their retail, their, their real estate, their amusement parks, their music. They're, they're more than that though. They're, they're information harvesting. They're like, they're just these multi-billion dollar entities and sure they have a film division or a television division, but they don't, and I'm sorry, I, I'm going to say it. They don't care about whether the movie or the show is good. They don't. They don't even watch this. St- lost oh. him again. Oh. oh Am I go. back? Yeah, yeah you're, you're back. back. You're back. Yeah, go ahead. We cut you off see? mid-sentence. Jeez. Yeah, see, Facebook's trying to shut me down. <laughs> uh, but it's I, I'll, I'll try to come down off the soapbox, but it's become such a business that they don't even really watch or care about whether the movie is good or the show is good. They care about the metrics. Yeah. And if a certain number of people, if a certain percentage of their subscriber base has watched a movie, then they like it. Yeah. And if a certain, and if it's only getting 13% of their viewership and they're only watching 47% all the way through it, then, Oh, that's bad content. We need to get that out of our pipeline. Like they're not even watching their shows. They're not even watching their movies. And when you dehumanize it like that, it becomes incredibly difficult to say, yeah, I know Behind the Mask didn't do well, but you have an immense fan base and people love Leslie Vernon. They love Nathan's performance. They want to see more of this guy, but the yeah. metrics aren't there. So they can't see past that. So they won't finance it. Yeah, it, it kind of it kind of reflects a little bit on, a, you know, I'm a, I'm a baseball guy. And uh, it makes me think about how people feel about, you know, st- you know, looking at data for baseball. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll a lot of teams these years around now, they're all very uh, all about like looking at the data and saying, OK, well, this player should play when this pitcher's pitching because he's, you know, better against yeah. lefties. Or, you know, it's like it gets so you get so into like the statistics and the, that you're not looking at the human element of the game anymore. Or, right. You know, in this case, the human element of of people that want to watch certain types of movies, like you're only looking at what made like money is not the factor mm. in what makes a good movie. Like a lot of good movies are flops. I mean, yeah. But what, you know. Yeah. And what we what we're seeing now, <clears throat> I think, really out uh, because of the writer's strike, because of the actor's strike, we're learning a lot more about how the the overall mind hive works for the for the corporations as david is saying and how they view things how they view their content how they view their writers and actors they're kind they kind of yeah they want to they want to replace them with robots <laughs> yeah they want to replace them with ai really if they could it's, if it was cheaper they would do it you know 
Uh, and I, I made the analogy recently, and I it, and this is exactly. Thank you for giving me the venue for this. No, the, yeah. the system as it exists right now, they treat. I am what's called a content creator. What Nathan does is the content, and they put it out in a pipeline to their consumers. So I'm like a soft serve ice cream machine, and they go in and they pull the handle and they get the soft serve ice cream, which is Nathan. And they put it in their pipeline and they pump it down the trough for you guys to feed on. And that's their trough. And you pay $15 a month to have your mouth in that trough. If you don't like it, that's too bad. If it does great, they'll pump more of it. If it does bad, they don't, they take that content out of their pipeline. And so it's all dehumanizing. Nowhere in there. I, I'm not, I'm not a content creator. Nathan's not content. My film isn't, isn't in a pipeline and you guys aren't consumers. I'm a filmmaker. Nathan's an actor. You guys are trying to be entertained by art. You're, you're, you're watching film. And it's so dehumanized because none of that translates to a spreadsheet anymore. And, and these corporations, their film and entertainment division or the television division is a loss leader. They don't even need to make money on their film or television department. They can carry it through the rest of their, you know, their, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not privy to what, you know, NBC Universal's portfolio is, but mm -hmm. I can tell you, they're, Amazon's not too concerned if their original program doesn't make money. Like it, yeah. it, it sucks that their department is losing money, but Amazon's making billions in profit. And it's just, it. That's what I said earlier on: is it used to be film studios made films, television networks made TV shows. So they were they they cared about whether the project was good, and you cared about whether the people making it were good, and you had a relationship with them. And that has unfortunately just been totally dehumanized. I think people, because of the strikes, are starting to see that and starting to understand that I'm not a content creator. You guys aren't pigs at a trough. It, it's it's there's human beings trying to make art that affects an emotional response in human beings, and it's how we connect with each other, and that's been lost. Yeah, even on a level of us as as people that uh, you know are watching film on just our level. You know, sometimes you you'll it, you find it hard to find other people to just talk about movies with. Um, because people look at people that have an opinion about movies as people that are, you know, they're too judgy. They're too, you know, like this or that. Like, it's like, that's the type of people you're trying to reach is people that actually want to have an opinion mm. about the thing that you're, and not, they don't just watch it and say, oh, that was good. <laughs> oh, that was, uh, that yeah, sucked. I mean, you know, like, say a lot about where we are now as a entertainment, uh, consuming body of people or, or culture, really where like how do we consume entertainment is changing vastly over the last several years it yeah, changed yeah. it was changing slowly and then all of a sudden got kicked into high gear because of the way the world went and the way the world is now as a result of all that so it's like it, it, and just like the generations change you know because people consume the, things through different forms the, of technology the more we've now made, the more we've made this, this stuff, stuff convenient the more mm -hmm. it made people complacent about what they're watching they don't look at the people that are behind it. People don't care about directors anymore. Very few get looked at as as uh, as ways of getting people to watch stuff. Like Christopher Nolan is one that sells himself, you know, as somebody you should come watch a Tarantino. Yeah. But, when, but, when you refer to their films, you're like, I'm going to go see the new Nolan movie. I'm going to see the new Tarantino yeah. movie. I mean, but um, that's like the very actors, small. Some know. actors still have that cachet, I say, you know. I don't, um, I don't know, Andrew. I think I think my, my terrified I'm terrified for the actors because I think we're entering a phase now where I don't think there are going to be TV stars anymore. I don't think you're going to have anybody that that is a, a, a worldwide you know, or even a national TV star. There's too many shows. And if you're not already on a franchise, I just don't think anything is going to reach that that tipping point. Like, you know, like Pedro Pascal, maybe, maybe he's going to be like the last sort of guy who's a TV and that, star. And that's because he's on so many things. So you, right. his, his visibility is so high that you recognize him constantly. You know what I mean? But that's and the thing. That, there's not going to be any more venues for, there is, I don't think there's going to be any more breakout TV shows that everyone's going to, like, you know, like who are the, like name, name me the top three actors from Game of Thrones and then name me the last project that they did. You can't yeah. do it. Because you, yeah. one of them, you probably can't think of all three of their names. And then number two, you don't know what the last thing they did is. Yeah. And I think I think that it's just, it's eroding the art of acting. Was, I don't know, we're getting off on a tangent no, there. No, I but. mean, you know, it, that's, that's a very interesting because I, I, I find t TV, the history of TV and the way it's evolved is somewhat different, but close to movies, but also, but, but unique in and of itself. Because you do see that where, 
you know, big, some people will be very uh, popular in the moment. And then just once the show ends, disappear. You know what I mean? It happens all the time. It happens with some movies. There are some actors and actresses who they'll do two, three, maybe four movies in one year, and then you won't see them for five years. You know, it happens. That happens there as well. So I'm just worried. I, I'm just worried we won't have that. That everyone has seen things. I think it's just becoming so fragmented. And and then the, you know people like you know like Chris Pratt. Sure, I love Chris Pratt, but you know if it wasn't for Guardians of the Galaxy, like would would he be? as big as he is you know what i mean and he was that's just because he's in a franchise that's been promoted so heavily like i i I don't know i've never met him but i bet you he doesn't want to be just known for that there's probably much there's and i'm sure and i know he does other things but he's he's one of the last big big movie stars like under you know on not pre-streaming you know what i mean like yeah He's he's I think he's the biggest streaming era movie star right now. For example, yeah, yeah, probably like probably him. Dwayne Johnson too. Dwayne Johnson's kind of made but his he way. Was, but he, no, 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 because he existed before streaming. He was wrestling. Right. Oh he well, had, yeah, he was yeah, huge yeah. movies. He established himself pre-streaming. I'm talking about somebody like you know the streaming area era Guardians of the Galaxy. Like Chris Pratt is somebody that I I yeah. immediately lean to because that's he's somebody that's out there in that streaming context that that's one of the last stars that everyone's watched those movies. Yeah. Um, no, I, yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's muddy, man. It's uh, I think it's, a lot of, a lot of what it is is like you said earlier, like too much. There's just too much coming out. Oh yeah. That it, you know, that we, that we, it, it, all the good stuff gets lost. Um, not only that, but what is interesting kind of to tie it back into the, the strikes and whatnot. Once, you know, obviously the, the WGA strike is is now over once the SAG strike is over and all these productions that were kind of stopped or stalled or delayed once they get but they get put back into production and start ramping up there's going to be a massive just dump of content to catch up with all of this you know what i mean and there's going to be even more content for us to consume and the way in which we consume it now the the whole binge model of it all is is fascinating because this happens to me i'll binge a show you know, in a couple of days. And then by the time the next season comes around, I won't remember what happened <laughs> because yeah. the next season won't come for another two years. And I watched the first one so quickly and so fast that I, that the content just doesn't stay with me. Yeah. It's, it's, it's short term memory, right? It's short term and, memory. Like you live and, in the moment and then move on to something else. Right. You know? And then you don't, and you don't, know, those, those characters don't impress like the way, you know, I, I'll date myself, but you know, Han Solo, like, it's been with me my whole life. You know what I mean? And like, I don't see a character like that. If I have to binge three seasons in three weeks, you're right. And then wait two more years. Like I'm, I'm not going to care about that character anymore. I haven't spent, it's like a, it's like a one night stand. It really is. Yeah. Like we're, we're having one night stands with these shows and we're not forming a long-term relationship where you do have to wait every week or you do have to wait for a couple of months or the next year for the next season to come out. Um, yeah, I don't know. See- no, it's again. It's I, 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 I'm, yeah. yeah, but but I do, I do want to circle. Let's go back over to, to um, uh, wait for it because uh, you know, like you said, th- this is um something that you this came out of just needing to update, you know, where where you were moving forward when it came to Leslie Vernon's uh, story. Yeah. So please to to sell people on when now. Of course, we don't know when this is going to hit the public yet. I don't know if there's anything in the works with that yet, but it is going around to festivals. But to to sell people on the idea of this uh, short film, please tell pitch it to everybody. Uh, it's a love note. I call it an Easter basket because it's filled with Easter eggs for you know slasher type films. I mean, it's really a you know like a pause and pause and examine it type of a thing. But um, and I don't want to oversell this as a Leslie Vernon project. Um, sure. you know, it's in that universe, but it is, I, I don't want anybody to be disappointed. Like, you know, Leslie's not stomping and killing through this film. <laughs> this is, this is an examination of, a, another, um, survivor girl, which in, in Leslie's world, those are final girls, yes. but in the context of the universe of Leslie Vernon stories, you know, final girl is a real world connotation from a book written by Carol Clover, you know, men, women, and chainsaws and final girls become uh you know uh, an archetype of modern slasher horror in our real world yeah. well in leslie's world those movies don't exist in leslie's world michael myers is a real guy jason Voorhees is a real guy so carol clover never wrote that book so i wanted to make it survivor girl instead of final girl just to sort of do a little bit of a meta shift um 
So um, the short from wait for it, therefore, is really an exploration of one of the par- things I love the most about horror is it, I, I always sort of feel a little disappointed when we get to the end of a slasher film and the, and the, and the killer is just stalking around and you can see him and it's out and it's just a fight and they end up in a fist fight. Like, yeah. I, I enjoy it, but I'm always a little disappointed, like, oh, man, he's out. You can see him. I've always enjoyed the buildup. I've always enjoyed the waiting for it. Like, you know, is he gonna, is he going to pop up? Is he not? What's happening? The world is shifting from normal to something's up. Like, that's the moment in horror that I've always enjoyed. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to explore a moment where there was a, a survivor girl who had survived an attack and was now trying to live her life. And it wasn't Friday the 13th. You know, it wasn't a year later. It was just like some Tuesday in November, right? And so she's trying to sort of live her life and not be too PTSD about it, but always have this like, man, I know that guy's going to come back. I know he is. Is it now? Am I imagining this? Is this in my head? Is there really somebody there? And I just wanted to explore those moments and get a pack of as many of them as I could into a, into a short film. Yeah, I, I think it's a great, you know, as, as as a lot of people would consider like a short film, it's kind of... And, and for the fact that you were this is your first time director, um, uh, you know, a great exercise in exploring them ideas. Um, you and, and you do you stuff so much into just 14 minutes um, to kind of, uh, you know, give little winks here and there of things that we see in other films or, you know, situations that we've seen in other films. But then they kind of they they resolve in a different way and they you know you kind of turn it on its head in some spots i thought that that was really clever and i thought really is like a good little appetizer for what could be something more um that we could get so yeah and it's the common experience right i mean that's you know as a filmmaker or screenwriter you always you're trying to figure out a way to get an emotional response from people that's why we do this why we tell stories And so I like the idea that those moments, like watching it at a theater is great because people laugh at, you know, the, the shower scene. And it's like, yeah, that, you know, that was that was pretty good. I love that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's like the fact that everyone laughed, like to me, that's the bonding. That's that's the like, aha, yeah. see, we all get that joke. We all get it. And those are the moments that I love where it's like it, it reminds us of our, of our commonality and not our differences. Yeah. Andrew. What did you think yeah. of the short film? Well, yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, I wasn't. I went into it not a, knowing anything about it. I think Stephen is the same way. But for me, it's what I was most surprised about. And this is not giving anything. We're just the meta aspect of it all, and the kind of you know the the toolbox of every single horror movie type of ism in there. In a way, you know, like you said, you do have the final girl or you know, in that aspect, but you have a different take on it. This kind of idea that how does a final girl live a normal life afterward? What would that look like? You know, and, you know, this is just like a regular day in her life, but her regular days are also filled with, like you're saying, it's not somebody who's dealing with like really, really traumatic PTSD stuff, which is a way in which you could have gone. It could have been someone who was you know, traumatized, constantly scared, constantly all those things. But it's just the little bit of PTSD that I think exists in all of us um, is kind of in this film. You know what I mean? The paranoia, the general anxiety. I mean, obviously with this person, it's it's more so because of her life experiences. But I think that everyone is kind of dealing with some type of anxiety about something in their past and the past of their in their lives. And the, the film kind of p- plays on that also. Um, yeah, it was really just overall, you know, well shot with certain homages and all that cool stuff. Um, yeah, it's, it, I'm just, it, it's relatively short and I want people to, you know, if you, if those of you do get to see it eventually, um, go into it with the expectations of, with all of that in mind, it, it's kind of not so much about what's going on in it, but what it's showing and depicting is fascinating. Um, and, yeah, and I think, I, I, think yeah. I mean, it's, it's the common it's the common, again, it's the commonality, right? It, it's it's about, it, I'm, we're not trying to fix anything. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to offer a solution to any of these problems in 13 minutes. I'm just trying to offer a common experience, as you said, Andrew, it's like, man, what would I be like if I went through this? What, 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 what would, how would I, how would I deal with going out to see, you know, movie night with my friends if I had gone through that? So I think to me, it's, it's not necessarily even about the, the the outcome of the short film 
Um, it's about the people watching it getting the joke. And that I think is the biggest drive for me. Yeah. So is there is there any talks yet of, it, of it, any way to kind of get it out there uh, for people yet? Or I mean, I think again, Chris Jarowski is the he's the guru on this. I I yeah. mean, I I would be lost without him. He's just so good at at figuring out where to go, who to go to, what to do next, what order. And I think that you know the the plan is to run out the festival clock. Where there's still a few coming up in 2023 and early 2024. You know, if we can get one or two, you know, feathers in our cap with a bigger one, then yeah, then I think once we've sort of spent that, then we'll look at a way to to monetize it and you know get it. I, you know, I I don't know. I mean, that's not, that's gonna be the next learning curve for me as a filmmaker. Is what do I do with the short film in the streaming age in post strike, yeah. and how will that work? And I have no idea. But I we I definitely want to get it out there. But you know, and not to dangle a carrot, but the the part of the other reason for this and the reason for including Nathan in it was to keep the drumbeat of Leslie Vernon alive because you know I, I hate I always say we were like Charlie Brown we're like Lucy Van Pelt pulling the football away because we keep saying sequel 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 and then it just yeah. doesn't happen in 20 years but we, we haven't given up as filmmakers you know I have not given up on I know I know the story I want to tell Scott wants to act, direct it Nathan wants to act it like we're not done with Leslie Vernon um, and so anything we can do to things like this, where we get to talk about Leslie Vernon again, if that can get a thousand more people saying, okay, if something happens, I'll be there. Like, that's absolutely 100% why I'm doing this. Well, I'm, Yeah. And you yeah. mentioned that you were going to, you know, a horror convention. I'm pretty sure this, you know, that's another way I, I see a lot of people learning about, not only learning about, but also celebrating movies and things that they love of the past. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I feel like behind the mask, probably does very well at horror conventions like i feel like the hardcore horror fans know of this movie and then kind of the word spreads from there or even just fans in general i know i learned about this movie from steven steven you probably learned it from someone uh, my, my friend robert who who uh i did with the film club movie show he was he's a hardcore horror guy and he he introduced me to leslie vernon and uh yeah yeah since then i'm just i'm so glad it's it's part of the Part of my collection, of course, uh, we do have the shout. Both of us have the oh, yeah. shout factory release of, oh, of yeah. behind the mask. Yeah, do we do have it? So for those of you listening and watching, like this is uh, the way it's available currently is through is the collector's edition through shout factory behind the mask, the rise of Leslie Vernon with a bunch of special features on here, including st stuff featuring you. <laughs> is it, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Scream Factory, I think. Is it Scream, Scream Factory, factory Scream shout? Factory. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, but. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, to get to be able to appear with Nathan and Angela, um, you know, to sort of answer your question, uh, Stephen, you know, the, the attention that I'm getting from Wait For It, is is there a feature film of Wait For It? No, there's not. I mean, I, I sure, I could come up with a story for Darcy Van Doren. I know what happened to her in my head, but there's a long way from having the idea as a screenwriter to yeah. a 110 page script. But I didn't, I don't feel the same passion that I do. The attention that we're getting for Wait For It we're, we're sort of knock on wood, but we're arm wrestling that to like, no, there's not a feature film from wait for it. But if you're that interested in it, what about you delve into the Leslie Vernon universe, which is a much bigger fan base. So we're, you know, we're trying to sort of judo maneuver that type of a situation um, and hopefully get the, the only thing that people ever ask Nathan or me or Angela about at festivals or, or signings is, is there ever going to be another Leslie Vernon story? And I feel an obligation. I mean, I'm not getting any younger. Um, <laughs> I feel an obligation to get that story out there. And I absolutely am doing everything I can to get the, the what is essentially the third Leslie Vernon story out there. Yeah, I did want to ask about the comic book situation because I'm pretty sure people listening probably want to know where where they can get it if it's still available uh, it's, online somewhere. It's hard to get it, but you can. It's um, there's a uh, it's a website. It's called Vernon's farmhouse i want to say it's Ver maybe if somebody can check it in it's it's vernon's vernon's plural farmhouse.com um and it's unfortunately at this point it's it's a it's a six episode six issues just bound into one anthology yeah yeah like the it's omnibus, a, a, think, omnibus think, yeah yeah and i think it's i think it's like a signed copy um you know 75 bucks i think and you get all six and it's signed by scott glosserman um because scott is 
Glen Echo Entertainment. And Glen Echo Entertainment is the home of, of Leslie Vernon. Yeah. So, you know, all roads lead I, through Glen Echo. I, um, I haven't lived there uh, for most of my life, but I am from Baltimore, Maryland. So, you know, okay. there is a, there is a, you know, I feel connected to, uh, you know, right. this story. I, I feel like I need to, you know, I know it's shot in Oregon. I know the movie's shot in Oregon. Yep. But, <laughs> well, yeah, but, but it's supposed to be set in kind of an innocuous, you know, northeastern town. So, yeah, yeah. But so the the omnibus is available at, at uh, Vernon's Farmhouse dot com, um, and I think that ultimately, you know, um, hopefully we get some traction, and then maybe there's a way to do like a. I, we've been idly daydreaming about doing like a stop motion kind of like almost animate animate the graphic novel. Yeah. yeah type of a thing to get some more to get that, but the story is canon. So absolutely. If people are Leslie Vernon fans, try to get your hands on the comic and you'll know what would happen in the third story. Yeah. I was going to say, so, so is the idea for what you do next kind of like building off of what you did in that comic? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, it, it was one of them things is back when the comic was coming out. I, I think my friend Robert got them, but I didn't, I wasn't able to get it at the time. I didn't have the money. To, to, to help to get that. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I think I'm going to definitely get the omnibus then, um, now that you're saying that it's got a place that you can still get it. So, um, I'll be excited to learn what happened then. Cause uh, I, I never, oh. never got a chance to read it. So, yeah. I mean, the, you know, that, that's sort of like Halloween two type territory where it's a little bit yeah. closer to the original. Um, you know, where we go from here is, you know, the, the metaphor is, what's happened in the intervening 15 years since you gotta do the ha- you gotta do the halloween h2o you know <laughs> in 20 years yeah or or more 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 halloween kills like halloween yeah. halloween ends halloween halloween kills halloween ends that that trilogy to me is really that that what david gordon green and and uh danny danny mcbride did like that that to me i'm sold like that that's yeah. that's how i would like to end but that's how i would like to not end, but that's the direction I would like to see like Leslie and Taylor's story go. Okay. Yeah, that's that, that kind of, I guess, transitioning into this, this idea, just kind of your genuine influences when it came to the story for Leslie Vernon. Was it, did you grow up watching all of those classic, uh, like, you? I mean, you name dropped all of them in Behind the Mask with, with you know, Jason Voorhees and Friday the 13th and Freddy Krueger, all these kind of stuff. Was that, was that the bedrock of kind of your love of horror? Yeah. I mean, Halloween... Halloween far and far and away, like, you know, just distant second would be Friday the 13th and nightmare. But I think, um, and I, I got, I, even before that, I was a sucker for, you know, Dracula, Frankenstein. Um, you know, I, I think, I, I think I accidentally started watching the shining when I was way too young and it was just absolutely traumatized me. Um, but I think Halloween, Halloween's the one where that was the first sort of like, I'm like, okay, this is something I'm going to watch again. Like I looked forward to Halloween to watch that movie. And I think that was one that's a bigger influence. And I, when I was writing behind the mask, the story I always tell is that I was, you know, I was living in California. I had just moved there recently to chase the screenwriting dream and had a conversation with my dad. And he was like, how's it going out there? And that sort of thinly veiled, like, when are you going to give up on the stream and move back to Wisconsin and get a real job? And, you know, I said, that's oh, pretty good. I've got some stuff in the fire. And, and I, I went, I got off the phone and it was sort of questioning, wow, what am I doing with my life? Is this the right thing? And Halloween was playing. It's like my comfort food. So it's playing in the background and I doze off and I like, as I'm dozing off, I'm like, I wonder if, I wonder if Michael Myers ever had a moment of doubt. Like, did he, did he ever wonder if he was making the right choices with his life? Maybe he should have been an insurance salesman. And I just had this funny image of like, what would, what would those guys do? Like on, what does Jason do on Saturday the 14th? Like, you know, how, how does he how does he get by until the next Friday the 13th? And I just had this funny idea of this up and coming slasher killer who's struggling to make it in his art, which is exactly what I was going through as a writer, which what Nathan was going through as an actor, which was what Scott was going through as a director. And the metaphor just bloomed beautifully. Um, so it was a combination of Halloween and me struggling to make it in a in a career, in a profession, which is artistic and not typically, you know, quote unquote, considered a real job. Yeah, that was that was one facet of of Leslie Vernon that I kind of stuck to a lot. And it was actually something that I was going to actually talk to you about. I was like, would you explore this in a sequel, maybe? Um, But like just the idea that Leslie Vernon, um, you know, there's a part in the in the in the film where he talks about they talk about um, with Scott Wilson's character uh, about like 
the, the difference between slashers back in the day and slashers now where slashers back in the day were about quantity. They were about like killing as many people until, you know, somebody showed up to try to stop you. But in this case, it's all about prep now. You know, the, yeah. the more modern killers are prepping. You gotta, make, you gotta prepping. make it more elaborate. You gotta make it more special, more Yeah, the story, the, the legend is like, uh, you know, something that you have to like fabricate in a way. You have to like build it up. And it's like, well, I thought yeah. it would be in interesting well, to explore the idea of, you know, him coming maybe in contact with one of them old school type of killers, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, what, what, and yeah. what Eugene is lambasting is, you know, it used to be, it wasn't about, it wasn't about the killer. Yeah. And that what happened, what happened in the eighties was in the, 80s and 90s, the, the killers became the heroes, yeah, which is yeah. really weird. You know, it, it became about Jason and Freddie and Mike, right. It wasn't, it wasn't about, it wasn't about just another hit and run of a, of a, you know, slumber party massacre or sorority yeah. house massacre or whatever. It became about the killers and it, it, that, and so what Eugene in the context of the, the meta is, is lambasting is, Man, they they changed it. They made it about themselves, not about the number of jobs they could do. Yeah. And I think that's very much what happened. And and so that is that is definitely something I want to explore in the yeah, third that, part. Cool. That is interesting, just because it almost feels like, you know, the characters became larger than the movies themselves, which also goes into kind of the idea we were talking about earlier with corporatizing or corporations trying to sell a product versus you know the movie itself and i feel like it, that happened a lot when it came to like the just the changing of the names of the franchises like i i was just recently because we, we talked about the child's play franchise at one point it, it, they stopped calling them child's play movies now they're chucky you know mm -hmm. what i mean because the character is chucky you know what i mean oh uh, with um the same thing with Fr friday the 13th you know they changed it to you know, Jason goes to hell, or you know, or something like that, yeah. or Freddy versus Jason, selling the characters and not so much and, the movies. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's kind of what I was thinking about. I mean, it's I don't have really details in my mind yet, but like you say, Freddy versus Jason, and I think about that for Leslie Vernon in some sequel, like where he meets another killer and he has to like the philosophies. Well, <laughs> I, will, I will, I will, I will leave you with this. I, I do have to jump off, unfortunately, of but course. I will leave you. I'll leave you with this, and I will say that you're close. But I think <sighs> that what what Nathan and I really want to explore more than that is that Nathan, I mean Leslie Vernon, as a purist, as yeah. a, he's a he's a he's a disciple of Eugene. He's a disciple of the old school. He's about yeah. the work. He's not about making it about himself. Exactly. And I think you know what I what we're going to explore is Nate or is Leslie just sort of being aghast at how far the the culture the job the the they do has drifted into the ego of of the killers and how far from what eugene would say is the job is to be the job is to be a counterpart to good the, the job is to yeah. be evil to give people an anchor to fight against there's a, there's so an Leslie, integrity to it a little bit yeah, you know? yeah. So leslie's a little aghast that you know that he even Leslie is becoming something of a hero. He's like, I, his, his attitude is I've never, I, I didn't do this to be cheered. I did this to be feared and it's become twisted. And so he, his struggle uh, has more to do with that than, than wanting to pair up or, or, you know, do a mashup or a duet, if that makes yeah. sense. I, lo I love it, man. I, that's yeah. about all I can. That's, that's where my mind's at right now. Well, I appreciate you sharing that little bit of, a little bit of tidbit about what you're thinking about with the with the future of Leslie Vernon. So yeah, that's, but, uh, that's, that's breaking news. Oh, <laughs> yeah, we got it. This is going to spread. We're going to spread it now. We got to definitely get it. It's going to be in the title: New Leslie Vernon sequel information. Um, I know. So, I but, uh, run with that. Yeah, but uh, I appreciate you with your time, man, and uh, and and talking with us, and uh, and uh, we we uh, hope everything moving forward. You know. Uh, gets pushed and of course just the writing in general just writers with the strikes and everything hopefully everything starts to smooth out for you guys and you get the pay you deserve and all that stuff and uh yeah and, i think i think we're doing well there i want to i want to see the actors i want everyone everyone and stand actors. strong and, and support support your the talent that you love they, they they have every right to make a living doing this as well so but i do also i always want to reiterate again i mean it from the bottom of my heart and on behalf of scott glosserman and nathan um Thank you guys. It, it's it's the websites and the blogs and the fan sites like you guys that have have kept Leslie Vernon's story alive and have made him what he is. It, it, 100%. We've gotten no help from any 
studio, any any large enterprise, everything that is Leslie Vernon is entirely because of the fans. And we know that every single day and we appreciate it. So thank you very much. Well, I, I appreciate that, man. And and we'll keep pushing. We'll keep pushing, try to get, keep it alive, man. And, uh, and good luck uh, moving forward. And we'll, we, you know, anytime we can help uh, in talking about anything else again, please let's, you know, let's, let's do it. Let's do it again. So, let's do it, man. Well, David, uh, David J. Stevie's guys, the writer, director of wait for it. Uh, hopefully we'll, you guys will get your eyeballs in that sometime soon. And uh, you got have a good rest of your night, man. All right. Take care fellas.